brought to us over the years. Today we're going to talk about, continue to talk about some people who had a big influence on the Bible that we have today. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the, uh, the English translations, the first English translations uh, of the word. The next two weeks, we're going to be studying uh, specific Bibles. The next week, we're going to study about the Geneva Bible, which was a Bible that was printed, uh, probably the largest printed uh, Bible uh, at that point in time. And then we're going to talk about the King James Bible and how it came together. Uh, so hopefully, you can be with us in uh, the next two weeks. Um, today, we're, uh, we're blessed to have uh, Ed Spivey. His wife Ann here today visiting with us, and Ed's going to lead us today in, uh, in the study of uh, John Wycliffe or Wycliffe, however you say that, and Tyndale or Tyndale, however you say that. Uh, depends on whether you're from America or from England, and you pronounce it different ways. But anyway, uh, Ed grew up in Houston. He attended Rice University and uh, graduated from Baylor. He has uh, two degrees from Southwestern Baptist Seminary. Um, he served as a, a Baptist minister for 52 years, uh, six full-time pastorates and 10 interim pastorates. He's uh, married to his wife, Ann, as I said. As she's a retired school teacher, and they, they live in Allen. Uh, they have two children, Kevin, who's a, a sports producer, TV sports producer, and Sandra, who's a gifted and talented uh, math teacher. They also are blessed with three grandchildren. They're members of First Baptist Church here in McKinney since 1997. People often ask me, how do, how do we find these speakers? How do these people come to us? And, uh, Ed came to me through uh, my neighbors, uh, Glenn and Liz Lowe, who are here visiting today. We were just having a discussion one night, and I was, I was, uh, I was really going through this painful process of trying to figure out what I was going to do for the quarter. And they brought up Ed's body. So that's how I made contact with him through Glenn and Liz. Um, so I know it's kind of risky to hand over the pulpit to uh, a retired Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's assured me that he's going to be through by 1045. <laughs> Please help me uh, welcome Ed Spivey. <laughs> You will be through by 10.45, whether I am or not. <laughs> it's a, a privilege to be here today, and uh, I, I trust that we will learn some things together that uh, will help us in our understanding of uh, our Bible, whichever one we prefer. And you'll uh, have an appreciation, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, you'll have an appreciation of whatever Bible you use uh, because of what you have heard today. Uh, I have uh, watched uh, the presentations by Gary Underwood and Eric Neubauer, and uh, I've appreciated those very much, and I hope you have. And. Uh, it, I, I understand that they were under a, a little bit of a challenge because uh, the Bibles that they were talking about were way back up and are largely uh, not in use anymore. So uh, today we're going to move to uh, the era of the Renaissance and and the Reformation. Now, uh, most of you, how many were here to hear Mr. Uh, Neubauer last week? Okay. Uh, most of you heard the explanation of how the uh, Latin Vulgate came to be and in the year 395, uh, the Pope decreed that all the Bibles, all the language of the church would be Latin. Of course, guess where he lived? <laughs> he, 
He lived where they spoke Latin. Well, that was a uh, significant time in history. And um, as I uh, told Roy on the phone that uh, historians refer to that as the beginning of the Dark Ages. Do you know why? We have any school teachers in here? <laughs> All right. Uh, largely, churches were responsible for the education of children. Most children uh, were allowed to go to a church school until about the third grade. In other words, they got reading and writing and arithmetic, and that was about it. If they were good scholars, then they were chosen by the church to advance. And by the age of 14 to 16, uh, they would move on to university studies. But, of course, they had to have that basis in Latin before they could move on. So that system resulted in not many people getting an education. So that's called the Dark Ages. If you're working in the fields all day long, they reason, you don't need to know Latin. So uh, the Bibles were in Latin, the church language was all, the mass was in Latin. And while the Latin Vulgate and the Pope's decree that Latin would be the language of the church unified the Roman Catholic Church and held it together for many years. It also omitted a lot of independent uh, Christian bodies. I was noticing on my way over this morning the Hope Church and the uh, Bethany Bible Church and the number of independent churches that we have in Plano today. Well, those would have been left out of the system. Christ United Methodist and other evangelical churches certainly would not have been in the system. And uh, so that's the reason it was called the Dark Ages. There was a, a genuine, organized suppression of the education system, and along with that, uh, there was a, a decrease in curiosity. Uh, learning became something for the elite, and it wasn't a very good system, we think. Well, Jerome was, was um, actually baptized in the year 363 at the age of 20. And he had begun to study the Bible and translated the Hebrew and Greek that he had into uh, Latin. And we don't know where all the errors occurred. Of course, everything was handwritten. All the transcriptions were handwritten. A lot of the people who transcribed it, we found out, didn't even know Latin. A lot of the priests didn't know Latin. A lot of the priests didn't even have a Bible. They would sometimes tell Bible stories. Sometimes they'd tell other stories. Sometimes priests were appointed because of politics. The, you've heard of the Borgia family that came into power in Italy. And they had bishops and popes and so forth. And it was entirely political. It was not religious whatsoever. But um, that, was, that was the situation during the Dark Ages. Uh, another uh, thing that happened during that period 
and uh, in the year 306, uh, it was brought up in one of the Lateran councils that priests ought to be celibate. Well, they didn't come to any conclusion at that time. And uh, as you uh, heard last week, Mr. Neubauer, the Roman Catholic Church changes slowly. Uh, that was first uh, brought up in 306 A.D. and in 1126 they decided that celibacy would be the rule. And in 1139 they decided that any priest who wasn't celibate would be dismissed. So it only took them 800 and something years to <laughs> arrive at that conclusion. And uh, of course you know that it wasn't <laughs> unanimously accepted. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire uh, rose in the power vacancy of that time. You've heard of Charlemagne and some of those emperors. Um, from 962 to 1306, the Germans controlled the world at that time. And of course, the Germans didn't like Latin any more than you do. And uh, so there became a, a change, an openness in the world that is called now the Renaissance, the awakening, a time of rebirth of thinking, of curiosity, and of discovery. <clears throat> it's interesting to me, because I was a history major, that it's during this period of time, this awakening time, that in England they signed the Magna Carta in 1215. The Magna Carta gave people the right to own land, to uh, have common, and the right to trial by jury. Did you know that? Any, any judges or lawyers in here? Uh, Magna Carta came as one of those things in the Reformation. Now there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff happening along about this period of time. Uh, for instance, the Chinese had uh, discovered uh, how to make paper back in the year 200. But there was no need for it. You know, people had papyrus, they had animal skins that they used to write on, those who could write. Only about 10% of the population could write. Uh, the population of London in the year 1000 was about 35,000. Paper came to Europe. Uh, they learned how to make paper. They, they originally made it, by the way, from grass. They pulverized and dried grass and then laid it out in sheets. And uh, then later, wood and rags, anything to add the fiber. Uh, that was, so paper was an important discovery, wouldn't you say? Matter of fact, now historians say that it's one of the four major contributions that the Chinese have made to civilization. So, it took quite a while. You know, the, the English weren't too swift either. <laughs> they, uh, they didn't discover how to make pencils till 1564. <laughs> they had paper, but <laughs> and, by the way, you know the you know the first pencils were flat. They were between there was a piece of graphite. They discovered a, a, a whole uh, graphite mine in England, and they discovered they could. Pack that graphite in between two pieces of 
board and make a pencil. But the pencils were flat, not the nice octagonal shape that you have today. Well, um, Columbus discovered America in 1492. Up to that time, people thought that the world was square or flat. <laughs> they thought if you went to the horizon, you'd fall off the edge. Well, this is the age of awakening. And uh, important, the Vikings had, had thought that for some time. Um, this is the age of uh, Leonardo da Vinci born in 1452. Michelangelo, born in uh, 1475. Uh, uh, Ulrich Zwingli was uh, born in 1484. Galileo discovered his, uh, his uh, telescope about the year 1600. The Johnstown's colony in America was founded in 1620. Isaac Newton concluded that gravity was what that was that called, caused the apple to fall from the tree in uh, 1670. John Bunyan, the famous Christian writer, lived from 1628 to 1688. Well, among all of that, there came these two men that we talk about today, uh, Wycliffe and Tyndall. John Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest. He uh, became disenchanted with the um, local pastors that he knew. Uh, many of them had mistresses. Some of them actually had wives. And this was against the rule of the church. Um, many of them uh, were drunken because in their worship system only the priest could drink the wine. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, because of drunken priests, he concluded that the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation was in error. Did you know what transubstantiation is? <laughs> All right, we've got a few who know. That's the idea that the wafer, the bread wafer, and the juice or the wine actually becomes the body and blood of Christ. Now, uh, some people still have that in the back of their mind, although they're evangelicals. Uh, evangelicals believe that the change is in the life of the believer, not in the elements that you partake of. And should somebody spill a glass of the juice or wine in your Lord's Supper service, you don't think, oh, that wasn't holy. You think that was messy. <laughs> but uh, it, we do not believe that it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. So, Wycliffe uh, began his life as a monk. As a monk, he began translating the scripture. By the way, as Royce said, you may call him Wycliffe, that's just fine. The language was not well defined at that time. And uh, I always called him Wycliffe. I did a paper on him while I was in college. And uh, I 
I uh, still have it in my file, but if you want to read 60 pages about Wycliffe, <laughs> <laughs> I always called him Wycliffe until one time we were visiting uh, the British Museum in London, and the guide called him Wycliffe. Of course, the English don't know how to pronounce a lot of it. <laughs> so, um, John Wycliffe began to translate the Bible. He was captured by a couple of verses that uh, are significant to us. Uh, the first one, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 19th verse. We have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. He says, you know, we don't, we don't have to have the church. We don't have to have the priest. We have access by faith because of Jesus. That was a tremendous revelation for him. Then he was captured by another verse. Ephesians 2.18 Furthermore, the Holy Spirit enables our access as we have access by one Spirit to the Father. So he was convinced that, as Romans 12, 1 says, it's the responsibility of believers to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So John Wycliffe, as he began to translate the Bible into English so that people people he believed ought to be able to read the Bible for themselves. Uh, as I said earlier, most churches had a copy of the Vulgate. Well, he took the Vulgate, which we now know was full of errors, but he took it and translated it word for word into English. A translation is kind of a tricky thing. I remember um, when we lived in the Texas Panhandle, we had a neighbor, a uh, young couple, who had a daughter who was the same age of ours. The wife of this couple was a German war bride. Her husband had been in the Army, the U.S. Army, and after uh, the war, they, he was stationed over there. They met and married, moved to our little community in the Panhandle of Texas where he worked in the office. Giselle came by our house one day and uh, wanted our daughter to go with her daughter. She said, we're going on a picnic. And so my wife Ann asked her, well, where are you going? And she said, to the river we are going. That's how German translates into English. So you have a little bit of difficulty translating, as you can imagine, from Latin into English. Now Roy, I have here a little bit of John's Gospel, the first of John's Gospel. So if you want to pass those out, people will see. Uh, you realize that he was translating into Chaucer style English. And uh, he organized a large group of people called the Poor Priests who also worked on his uh, uh, copying his translation. Uh, they were not allowed to do this in England, uh, so most of it was done in 
either over in Belgium or in Germany. And uh, this, this caused some problems, but uh, since it was illegal for English people to own a copy of the Bible, uh, this was a real treasure. The remarkable thing I think about this, you visit the, the British Museum and they, they'll tell you that there are over a hundred complete copies of Tyndall's hand-copied Bible in museums today. Isn't that remarkable? They smuggled them. One of their favorite methods of smuggling them into England was in sacks of grain. Well, uh, you know, that's a little bit uh, in, ingenious, but uh, uh, that, that was their favorite method of, of smuggling them back into England. Now, later on, we'll talk about Tyndall. Tyndall published thousands of copies of the Bible in English. Uh, of course, he, the printing press had been invited, invented by then. <coughs> he was uh, doing this in Antwerp, Belgium, and uh, he had 6,000 copies at one time, <coughs> another time uh, more copies. Actually, uh, Tyndall died before the, the translation was complete, but those who were working with him completed the translation and only two copies of Tyndall's translation are in museums that they know about. So the fact that there are over a hundred <clears throat> copies of the Wycliffe translation is, is really remarkable. Now, you see uh, the colored page here. Uh, the first part <coughs> just tells you what this is about. And you notice about the middle of that quote that you see Jerome's name. He is explaining that, that uh, this is his translation and it comes from the Latin Vulgate, which was Jerome's translation. And then he starts, well, by the way, these, these copies, some of them were very elaborate. This one that came from the British Museum, you can see, is, is decorated all up and everything. Could you read that? <laughs> In the beginning, well, the word, and the word was at God. <laughs> you, we don't use the Wycliffe translation <laughs> nowadays, don't you? <laughs> um, the English language was in flux and you could spell things any way you wanted to you could pronounce things any way you wanted to uh, Chaucer wrote in this same what's called Midland English and have any of you tried to read Chaucer? Uh, you know <laughs> good luck to you <laughs> Uh, on the back page, <coughs> the back of the page, you see uh, this is a concise history of the English Bible. Uh, last week you covered the first paragraph. Uh, today we're more or less covering uh, the next uh, three paragraphs, and then you'll you'll come down to uh, others later on. Well, um, you understand that under the, these circumstances, it was difficult to publish a Bible because you had to have a lot of willing people who would take it seriously and do it well. And uh, these were the 
uh, text, the, the verses that uh, Wycliffe gave to those he was trusting to do the translation or copy his translation. Uh, out of Deuteronomy 4.2, you shall not add to the word that I command you nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. His second word of instruction was from 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then the third word of instruction was, from Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of prophecy of this book that if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of the, this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. So, he was very specific and he wanted them to take very seriously the job that they had at hand. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our beef, if you were, is not with John Wycliffe, but it's with the process that was used. The Latin Vulgate, um, was not a very dependable translation. It didn't use all the sources that were available. And he just translated from the Latin Vulgate. There are a number of scriptures um, that are changed or I have a list somewhere. The most notable is uh, the end of John 7 uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, now that we have the sources from, uh, from Greece, from Alexandria in Egypt, matter of fact, uh, that was one of the things that was almost totally overlooked in the early translations. And it turns out that the Coptic churches in, in uh, Egypt had the most ancient copies of these Bible books. And that, that became uh, revolutionary in the translation uh, of the Bible in later years. Well, we're grateful for Jerome, we're grateful for the Latin Vulgate, but we recognize that it was an imperfect work. And there are others that are not much better. Wycliffe lived in this age of uncertainty. In 1378, they had two popes. You knew about the schism in the Roman Catholic Church, I trust. Um, his, uh, he had three main contributions. One is he argued against the uh, idea of transubstantiation. We've already mentioned that. The second was that he believed that the church was composed of people elected by God, not those who were members of the Roman Catholic Church. And boy, that that's revolutionary in that time, isn't it? And third, he thought that the scriptures, not church tradition or papal pronouncements, were authoritarian. So he thought that every believer ought to be able to read the Bible for himself. Well now, this opens lots of doors, doesn't it? 
Well, as you read off on that sheet on the back, you'll understand why there's so many Bible translations today. But uh, is that dangerous? Do you think? Uh, do you think people ought to be able to read the Bible in their own language, or should some kind of church authority say what's all right? I think the more translations you have of the Bible, the more possibility to stray from you know, something that what should be the appropriate word. What do you think? You think more or better or more is less? <laughs> I think people are more likely to go to the Bible and study it if it's in their own language. I think you're right. I <laughs> get more people you know, throughout the world. They can right. read it their own, whether it's 100% accurate or, 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 or not. Or just John 316. All right. Yeah, if you can't read it, then you won't know. That's right. I had an experience several years ago. A young man in our church in Elkona came to talk to me. He had been asked to teach a Sunday school class. He said, Pastor, I've got a terrible problem. So I just can't understand the Bible. <laughs> that, that is a problem if you're trying to teach. You know? <laughs> and uh, so uh, we talked about it. He was using the King James Version, which, you know, that was the standard back then. And so I had a couple of shelves in my study of books and translations, so I gave him a load of them and a few days he came back and he had chosen the NIV. Now the NIV is not a word for word translation. It's a phrase by phrase translation. And by doing that they made it easy to read. But it is not a it doesn't claim to be a word for word translation. It doesn't say to the river we're going. Um, so he came back and, and he said, this is the one I can understand. Well, about a year after that, Dave came to me again. He said, Pastor, I've got a problem. I think the Lord is calling me to preach. And my wife doesn't think so. <laughs> so we, we made that a matter of prayer and he became really serious in his Bible study and people from his class a class of, of young couples began to tell me about how their eyes were being opened to what the scripture meant and uh, so I knew the Lord was using it well one day Krista came she said, Pastor, I've got a problem. <laughs> she said, Dave feels called to preach, but I didn't think so. But over the last year, I've seen God at work in his life in such a way that I think as his wife, I need to go along with it. She was a school teacher by then. Dave had been a roofer by trade. So, uh, he went on to seminary. There's a special program for men who are over 32 years of age who go to seminary. Pastored a little church up in Decatur, Texas. And um, then one day in the mail, I received a, a notice of request from the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention saying that Dave and Krista had applied to be foreign missionaries and they wanted my recommendation. So I sent it in. Well, the last of the story is for the last 10 years they have been missionaries in Wales and uh, they live in an apartment building now in Cardiff where there are more than 1,200 families most of them Muslim. 
and they make friends of these Muslim people by inviting them to celebrate July the 4th or Mother's Day or Easter, Christmas, or whatever. They, and they must think that Americans are just party people. <laughs> but in doing that, in fact, that Krista wrote last week, she said, when we arrived home today, there was a basket of fruit and so forth, fruit juices and all, at our door. And a sweet note from our neighbor saying, thank you for the gift you gave us one of their children that had a birthday. Thank you for the gift you gave us. We wondered about this, but we talked to a friend back in Egypt, and they said the first gift is always the best, so you need to respond by giving gifts to these friends. So they're making inroads there, and who would have thought that a roofer who couldn't read the Bible 15 years ago would now be trying to evangelize a whole Muslim community in Cardiff, Wales. I think you said it. When the Bible is in the language of the people, they understand it, they apply it. It may not be 100% accurate. Uh, you know, there may be things we discover yet. Well, let me quickly talk about uh, our, our other brother, Tyndall. Tyndall argued uh, that he was also a Roman Catholic priest. And uh, he lived uh, about a hundred years later. He was largely influenced by the scholar Erasmus. Erasmus was Dutch, but uh, taught at Oxford in England. And uh, these were the conclusions that Tyndall came to. He maintained that faith alone justifies. Second, he maintained that to believe in the forgiveness of sin and embrace the mercy offered by the gospel was all you needed for salvation. Third, he said that human traditions cannot bind the conscience except in certain circumstances. Fourth, he denied the freedom of the will. In other words, he didn't believe in free will. Fifth, he denied that there's purgatory. Sixth, he had affirmed that neither the virgin nor the saints can pray for us. That was a revelation to the Catholic system, wasn't it? And seventh, he asserted that neither the virgin nor the saints could be invoked by us in our prayers. Well, um, William Tyndall didn't live very long. Uh, by the way, the average lifespan of uh, people in that era was 49 years. Um, but he was uh, burned at the stake and uh, then, uh, kind of crazy, uh, about, a, about 25 years after that, John Huss was burned at the stake in, uh, over in the Czechoslovakia area. And all of a sudden, the Roman Catholic Church decided to dig up John Wycliffe's bones and burn them. <laughs> so, uh, it's amazing to us 
at Wycliffe, Wycliffe was the one uh, who translated from the Vulgate. But Tyndall was able to get hold of the original manuscripts of the earliest that they had at the time and to translate directly from Hebrew and Greek. And in doing so, he produced what we would call the first genuine English translation, original English translation. As I mentioned earlier, um, he was a contemporary of Martin Luther and other uh, revolutionaries. As a matter of fact, after he had been in prison and got released, they released him to the city of Worms, where Martin Luther had posted his 95 theses on the church door. Um, but we, we understand that these men were captured by the power of the Word of God. And although Wycliffe died of a stroke, <laughs> they burned his bones because they didn't like it. And Tyndall was burned at the stake because of his powerful witness to the gospel. standard is thought to be the most accurate translation. Uh, the, the English Standard Bible, which was published, I think, in 2002, uh, is considered to be a big improvement over the NIV in that it combines the word-for-word -word translation with the ease of reading. The uh, English standard does both. The New American is a little bit clumsy to read. Now, Holman, the Baptist publishing house, has published the whole Holman Christian Study Bible. Now, Baptists call it the Hardcore Southern Baptist Bible. <laughs> HCSB. <laughs> it has the same problem as the New American standard. It's a little clumsy to read in places. And, uh, you know, those of us who memorize scripture from the old King James have a terrible problem with those clumsy translations. Uh, so, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. The New American Standard is considered to be the most accurate word for word translation. English Standard Bible is supposed to be accurate and easy to read. Any other questions? <laughs>